برنامه نانگلوساخ رو نگاه میکنید مجله اجتماع سیاسی که به زبانهای فارسی و انگلیسی روی کانال جدید پخش میشه سلام به همگی من مرم نمازی هم و من فریبرز پویا هستم در برنامه این هفته مصاحبه ای داریم با یزمی رحمان از فضای سکیلار در رابطه با تعدل زوجات در زم در رابطه با تعداد وسیع پناهجان در سال 2015 صحبت خواهیم کرد اینکه ماهواره های ساتلایتی باعث فساد میشن و طلاق. و طلاق و مردان در حجاب با ما باشید در این بخش اخبار دوست داریم تمرکز کنیم روی اخباری که از سازمان ملل منتشر شده اخیرا در رابطه با تعداد پناهجویان در جهان گزارشی که منتشر کردن گفتن که الان 65 میلیون بیش از 65 میلیون پناهنده کسایی که به طور اجبار مجبور شدن فرار کنن چه تو خود کشور چه به خارج کشور و این آمار رو که تقسیم کردن میگن که روزی 36 هزار نفر دارن آواره شدن 34 هزار نفر ببخشید و هر دقیقه 24 نفر داره آواره میشه روزی 34 هزار نفر این بخشی از انتخاب طبیعی مردم نیست که به خاطر زندگی بهتر در واقع نیروی کار حرکت نیروی کار حرکت نیروی انسان تصمیم آدم باشه این اجبار مهاجرت اجباری به خاطر جنگ به خاطر نبودن امکانات امکاناتی رو که در واقع زندگی انسان رو تهدید میکنه و این قضیه رو به نظر من توی دنیا یه درجه از غیر درجه از اینکه مردم نمیخوان قبول بکنن مسئولیت خودشون رو توی دنیا این یک و دولت ها دولت ها به خصوص و در واقع وسایل ارتباط جمعی دنیا و مسئله رو سعی میکنن به یک موضوع رب بدن و بگن خب مردم همونجا بمونن و سیاست هایی رو بیارن که مردم تن روز توی دریا غرق بشن من فکر کنم تمام جهان مسئولیت داره در, در مقابل این بخاطر اینکه اون چارچوبی رو که این اتفاق داره میفته مسئولیت جهانی دقیقا مسئولیت جهانی و حق پناهندگی حق امنیت یک حق انسانیه تمام اخیرا مصاحبه داشتم با یزمین رحمان در رابطه با تحقیقات 6 سالش در رابطه با تعداد زوجات با ما باشید و این مصاحبه رو با هم نگاه کنید Thank you Yasmin Rahman for speaking to us I wanted to ask you about your extensive research into polygamy in Britain Can you tell us what your main findings were Okay I started the research 6 years ago it began life as a master's dissertation looking at um, whether or not polygamy amongst Muslims in Britain was a conducive context for violence against women and girls. In these six years I've, I've expanded it out because I want to also look at um, other faith groups. But most of my interviews overwhelmingly have been with Muslim men, women um, and young people. I think it's a conducive context for, viol for violence against women and girls. It's abusive. Um, it, it's um, it's unequal in terms of gender. Um, when people talk about women choosing this option, I think they're choosing, and I use that word really carefully, within a framework of extremely limited options. Um, we know that it can be used um, as a means of um, engaging in child marriage, forced marriage, there is domestic violence, there is sexual violence. Um, there's also enforced cel celibacy, so where you have the first wife who is replaced by a second wife, she's not free to enter into any other relationships and can, can find herself in terminal, terminal um, enforced celibacy. Um, but even where you don't get physical violence and abuse, you get the emotional impact. And I've spoken to countless um, young people and slightly older who grew up in polygamous households and have spoken really movingly of this sort of sense of rejection that as their mother was rejected, so were they as children. 
and that leaves that does lasting damage so i think it's a really harmful practice that's why i'm calling for a move away from harmful traditional practices to harmful marriage practices which i think would fit polygamy much more um uh, much more easily than the harmful traditional practices do but also it would catch um it, it would i think it would catch a range of other things but also make it easier to show the continuum between different forms of violence that occur within marriage structures. But some will say that it's just yet one more form of marriage. You know, if you defend gay marriage, for example, it's not uh, the norm, but it needs to be accepted. Some will say polygamous marriages are just something that need to be accepted. That's an argument I hear an awful lot, is that, you know, monogamy has moved on, we now have same-sex marriage. I've also heard that okay, this is the type of marriage, one of the arguments that, that many of the men put forward to me was, well, would you prefer that I had lots of mistresses and lots of girlfriends? At least this sort of frames it within um, a religiously justified, a religiously sanctioned marriage. My response to that is I think the state has a responsibility. When, when we're talking about abuse and we're talking about harms and we're talking about denying people access to their rights, then I think the state has a role to play and has to make a decision in terms of polygamy. I think this thing about marriage is changing, of course it is, but do we then allow temporary marriage? Do we then allow child marriage? Where does it then stop? I think there is, it is absolutely imperative that we draw a line in the sand and that line should be drawn where we're considering harm or potential harm. What about uh, people who've had polygamous marriages abroad and then they come to live in Britain? That's the real area of tension, and I think that's the real complexity, is um, particularly with the Syrian context and with the refugee crisis, or with people coming from Africa, where they, they are in legally recognised marriages that have occurred in countries where polygamy is recognised. How do we respond? Because they're fleeing situations of extreme danger. If you or I were in those situations, we would want to be free of them. So I think that there is a tension between how do we manage that and how do we also ensure that traffickers don't exploit um, the, the opening up of a space for refugees to come in even if they are in legally recognised polygamous families and using it as, as a means of trafficking women through. So it's a really difficult question for which I haven't got an answer. The other issue is of course homegrown polygamy. And that I think we can deal with much more easily, but that requires political will and, um, and a robust response, which I'm not convinced that at the moment anyone is prepared to deliver. What do you think is a uh, political response to this issue, the homegrown polygamy? I think it's about registration of marriages. Um, this is actually where I think that real kind of tension between freedom to practice one's religion and gender equality and the right to life I think really sort of butt up against each other. There is a campaign for registered marriages um, which I think is you know is admirable and it's being led by lots of Muslim groups but we have bigamy laws I think the state needs to take a clear stand and say that only legally recognised marriages will, will are allowed to happen within this country. There is there is no ta unofficial recognition um, of polygamous marriages or you know turning a blind eye. Now the difficulty is with Muslim marriages is that they don't need to take place in a mosque. So registering the mosques is only part of the problem. Many nikahs take place in a home or in the friend a friend's house. I think it's then about possibly bringing in laws that impose a sanction on anyone conducting a polygamous marriage or conducting a, a religious marriage without any evidence of a civil marriage having taken place beforehand because there are monogamous marriages that are also just conducted um, as a religious marriage and those the, the, the people within that union, the man and the woman, cannot then avail themselves of the protection that the state offers people who are legally val and validly married. What about other countries? Have they been able to address this in any way that we could learn from here in Britain? There's the Customary Marriages Act in South Africa, which was, which was trying to protect people who were already in polygamous unions. And I think that's 
that's a continuation for me of colonial practices of saying family matters can be dealt with through religious tribunals, religious courts or customary courts. Um, that goes some way to it. I, my, my preference is for the Canadian model which um, in 2011 upheld its ban on polygamous marriages. That, that was the result of a, um, a, a review that was, was judge-led and conducted by um, Justice Bowman, um, who was a Chief Justice in Canada at the in British Columbia at the time. Um, you know, they took evidence from all sides, but it was framed not within religious practice, but within a human rights framing. Does this practice lead to harm? Is it abusive towards women and children? I mean, we, and that was very specifically looking at the Mormon context, not the Islamic context. And in the Mormon context, you have exactly the same things playing out as you do in a Muslim context. Child marriages, um, you have young men who could potentially access some of the women, literally being thrown out of the compound and left um, at the borders. And you know, there, there's lots of research about um, the life outcomes for those young men, which, which aren't positive. So I, th I think a clear, firm stand from, from the position of the government in the way that we've done with forced, forced marriage, the way that we've done with honour-based violence, the way that we've done with female genital mutilation. The, the, I guess the difference with polygamy is forced marriage and female genital mutilation on a base violence can all be dismissed as cultural practices. Polygamy is a religious practice. It is contained within the Quran. The Prophet... Um, Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, he he had you know, um, 11 marriages. It is difficult to then say to people, you know, um, that, that we're, we're taking a stand that this is not acceptable. But the qualification for me is, is it's not a religious edict, it's not an order. It, the Quran says you can enter into these marriages, but it's preferably to stay in one. It's not something that would limit your ability to be a Muslim if you did not have a polygamous marriage. Millions and millions of Muslims do not have polygamous unions. So, um, and there are also, I think, um, lots of reinterpretation going on. Sisters in Islam in Malaysia um, have done some absolutely groundbreaking, amazing work at looking at the harms of polygamy and trying to reinterpret Quranic texts. That's not the position I come from, although I think their work is absolutely, um, it, you know, to be looked at and to be praised and to be commended. But I think taking that clear stand and just saying, in this context, it's not acceptable, and framing it within the context of harms, framing it within human rights, this is nothing to do with welfare benefits. It's not about immigration. It's not about othering. This is about protecting people from abuse. Thank you. Thank you. امیدوارم از مصاحبه با یزمین رحمان خوشتون اومده باشه به نظرم نکات خیلی مهمی رو مطرح میکنه و یه نکته خیلی مهم و برای من اساسی اینه که تعدد زوجات ربط داره با خشونت و تبعیض علیه زنان ربط مستقیم با هم دارن نکته جالبی توی این مصاحبه برای من این بود که پاسخ به این قضیه نه نگاه از زاویه فرهنگ از زاویه مذهب بلکه از زاویه حقوق انسانیه این راه حلیه که میشه پیدا کرد در رابطه با تمام این مشکلات در رابطه با دادگاه شریعه هم همینطور کانادا این کارو کرد هم در رابطه با دادگاه شریعه هم در رابطه با مسئله تعدد زوجات زوجات و پاسخ اصولی رو از زاویه حقوق انسانی داده ما هم باید این کارو بکنیم فتوه احمقانه این هفته از رئیس بسیجی هاست که ایشون گفتن که این محواره ها باعث فساد و طلاق و غیره میدونی اخی ایشون از زمانی که کوچولو بوده کوچولو بوده نگران فساد بوده در جمهوری اسلامی و طلاق همهش تمام همه غمه ایشون برای همین چیزه برای فاسد ترین رژیم دنیا داره کار میکنه اصلا کل اینا سیستمشون فساده البته یه دروغ دیگه هم ایشون گفته گفته که یک میلیون نفر اومدن ماه... دیشای ماهوارش رو خودشون اومدن تحبیل هم گفتن ما دیگه نمیخوام طلاق بگیریم من نمیخوام فاسد باشیم <تصفح> <تصفح> و خیلی جالبه داعش و عربستان سوریه اینا همشون اینه هم کار میکنن نه؟ البته ایشون به برنامه نانگولسترخ و رفیقاش گفتن چی؟ 
آره به مام گفته بودن که برنامه ما فاسده عجب معلومه همه کاراشون برعکسه اینا اصلا سردر عوان لحظه زیبای زندگی این هفتمون از ایران و جنبشی که اخیرا در ادامه هجاب برداشتن زنا در ایران بوده که و این این بار هجاب بر سر کردن مردانه که خیلی عجیبه مردان دارن هجاب به سر میکنن در حمایت از همسراشون از زنای ایران من اول که این رو دیدم زیاد موافق نبودم و گفتم که صحبت که کردیم هم این که این تبلیغ به یه شکلی هجاب از یه طرف زنها دارن هجابشون رو به هم و یه طرف مردم آمدن هجاب سرشون کنن وقتی مصاحبه چند تا از این مدان رو خوندم با دقت توجه کردم دیدم دارن توضیح میدن که چطور هجاب اینقدر سرکوبگر احساس خفگی میکنن حتی برای مدت کوتاهی و چطور زنان تو جامعه ایران و تمام کشورها اینقدر فشار بهشون داره میاد و حجاب و توضیح این به نظر من خیلی جالب بود و اینو به عنوان یه حرکت اعتراضی علیه حجاب میشه به رسم به نظر دقیقا این جزوی از جنبش اعتراضی علیه حجاب و به خصوص میدونین وقتی که نگاه یه مرد حجاب میکنه سرش خیلی مشخصه که چقدر مسخره است و چقدر ناراحت کننده است که میبینیم که اینکه زن هجاب میکنه سرش برای ما خیلی یه چیز عادی شده و این که مرد اینو میکنه سرش دقیقا هجاب رو میبیاره اون جایی که بد باشه یه چیزی که واقعا منفور مسخر است و چرا باید روی زن ها به خصوص تحمیل بشه به هر رو رسیدیم به آخرهای برنامه من امیدوارم از این برنامه خوشتون اومده باشه تا هفته آینده امیدواریم روزها و شبای خیلی خوبی داشته باشید تا بعد Goodbye. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo- alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.